world of the perishable. It's all around us. Go to the store, buy some bananas, set them on the counter, come back, they're brown. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, reminds us our own bodies are perishable. They will someday be traded in for one that, thank God, is imperishable. I mean, we do everything we can to tell ourselves differently. We brace them up and lift them up and cover them up and paint them up. But the fact is, they're still perishable. Yes, they are. But even now, there is the imperishable. You see, the agent that has cleansed us and bought us and redeemed us and given us peace with God is never-ending. It's never weakened. It's never diluted or outdated. It is incorruptible. The saving virtue of His blood is good for time and eternity. It has no expiration date. It abides forever. Jesus died for you and me 2,000 years ago. He carried His cross up a hill where Roman soldiers were waiting for Him. They took their hammers and spikes and nailed Him to the cross. They placed a crown of thorns upon His head. They thrust a spear in His side 2,000 years plus ago. But the power and the virtue of that sacrifice and that shed blood is as efficacious today as it was on the day He died. It was true then, it's true now, He's able to save to the uttermost. Time has not diminished the saving power of the cross. As Andre Crouch used to sing, the blood will never lose its power. Martin Luther knew that. Martin Luther was translating the Bible into the language of his German people. And as he did so, Satan would come to him and attack him. In fact, they say there's an ink spot in Wartburg Castle where Martin Luther threw an inkwell at the, at the devil and his accusations. One day the fiend of hell came to him with mockery and accusation, just like he comes to all of us. And he told Luther that he was not worthy to undertake such a noble task that he was too much of a sinner for such an undertaking. And he held up a long list of sins that Luther had thought and spoken and committed in his life. In fact, three times he came back to Luther with a long list of sins. And Luther had no argument. He knew that as far as that was concerned, Satan was accurate in his list of heinous sins. But finally... Luther said, Satan, is that all that you have? He said right at the bottom of the list, these words, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the power. That's the efficacy of this blood. That's the good news for believer and unbeliever. And if you're not a believer... Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how low you've sunk, you can be saved. You can have your sins washed away. Yes, you can have peace with God and fellowship with God, not by your works, but by His work on that cross. Not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Secondly, it is a sinless blood. Look at verse 19, if you would. Peter brings that truth into focus. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Now those words take us back to the Old Testament. This is the Jew writing to Jewish people. And he's building on the building blocks of the Old Testament. You see, at the Passover, when God was preparing to deliver Israel out of Egypt, the people of Israel were told to take a lamb from the flock, what? Without blemish. Not just any lamb, but they were to carefully and closely inspect the flock and find one without blemish. And the lamb was to be killed. And it sounds gory and brutal because it is. 
and the blood spread over the doorpost of their homes. Oh, you say that is, that's as terrible, that's offensive, that's disgusting. What would Peter say about that? And you're right, and that is the point. And so is sin. Sin is horrible. Sin is shocking. Sin is a terrible thing before God. Sin offends a holy and righteous God. Sin is so repulsive that when Jesus became sin for us on the cross, He had to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, the Israelites were told to spread that blood of the Lamb over the doorposts. And then God said, I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike all the firstborn, but when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You say, well, what kind of God is this? Well, it's not that God is bloodthirsty or that He likes violence or R-rated movies or relishes the sight of blood. The message is sin is a horrible offense before a holy God. But this holy God is also a loving God, and He's provided a sacrifice for our sins, a lamb without blemish or defect. And this Old Testament Passover lamb was a picture of what was to come, a picture of what was fulfilled in the New Testament, the lamb who came, who was without blemish or defect the spotless, sinless Son of God who was sacrificed for our sins on the cross of Calvary. Enter the New Testament. Paul says Christ is our Passover, sacrificed for us. John the Baptist introduced him like no man has ever been introduced. John pointed to him and said, Behold! the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was the Lamb without spot or blemish. He was the Lamb tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Hebrews describes Him like this, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. This is the sinless one dying for sinners. This is the innocent one dying for the guilty. This is the helper from heaven dying from the helpless and hopeless. And he who knew no sin became sin so that we who are so well acquainted with sin could be cleansed from sin. And it's through that sacrifice and only that sacrifice that we can meet the demands of verse 16 where Peter says, Be holy because I am holy. Because holiness is not an achievement based on what we do. It is a gift given. It is a position granted based on what the sinless Christ has done for us. Thirdly, this is a redeeming blood. And I want you to notice the aspects, the spokes that flow out of the hub of that statement that it is a redeeming blood. First of all, we are redeemed with, verse 18, it is not with perishable things, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ that we have been redeemed. Redeemed means to be bought or purchased. We have been redeemed, we've been bought, we've been purchased, we've been made children of God through His precious blood. I heard a story many years ago. I can't remember things from yesterday. But I can remember some things from many years ago. And I heard a story, and I'm sure it must have been 30 years ago that I've never forgotten, the story of the little boy who, under the guidance of his father, built a beautiful little boat. And they, he loved taking that little boat out in the backyard. They had a little stream, and he'd take that little boat out there, and he just delighted in watching that little boat dance on the sparkling waters. And day after day, he would take that little boat out there. Well, one day, a strong wind coming from an unusual direction came up, and it took that boat, and it took it downstream. And the little boy ran as fast as he could along the banks, trying to keep up with that boat, but it went too fast. 
and he lost the sight of his boat. And you can imagine he was very distraught, very sad. His favorite toy was gone, and he thought it was gone forever. But just a few days later, he was walking downtown, and as he walked by a pawn shop, something caught his eye. There on display in the window of that pawn shop was a boat. It was his boat. And he went inside, and he told the owner of the store, he said, Sir, that's my boat. And he said, well, son, you can buy that boat. And he gave him the price, and the little boy went home and emptied out his piggy bank and came back into the store and laid his money down on the counter and took that boat, tucked it under his arm, and began to walk out that store. And as he was walking out, he was heard saying, You're mine. You're twice mine. You're mine because I made you. You're mine because I bought you. And we are His. And we are twice His. We are His because He made us. And we are His because He bought us. We have been redeemed with His precious blood. Also, we have been redeemed from. In verse 14, you see that we've been redeemed as obedient children. Do not conform to the evil de desires you had when you lived in ignorance. We've been we've been redeemed from sin and slavery and ignorance. We've been redeemed from the slavery of sin, our evil desires, and the ignorance of not knowing how to get out of our sins. Now, as traffic goes by this morning, they look over here and the world pities us. They think we're ignorant. Those poor, misled, misguided people sitting in church on a Sunday morning all dressed up, singing, giving. They pity us. But you know, the Bible says we're the enlightened ones. The Bible says we're the ones who have received revelation, truth, not from man, but from God. We have been redeemed from ignorance and the slavery ignorance always brings. And in verse 18, we've been redeemed from the empty way of life. Don't pity us. We found truth. And truth is what sets you free. Then we've not only been redeemed with, we've not only been redeemed from, but we've been redeemed to. Somebody, uh, if you'll notice in verse 15, let me say first of all, that uh, Peter says, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And somebody gave holiness a bad name. And I think I know who did it. We did. <laughs> the church. When we emphasized external conformity instead of the condition of the heart. When we produced a long list of do's and don'ts instead of risking the adventure of a spirit-led life. When we place cultural preferences on the same level as divine edicts. And too often in some churches, and you know which ones I'm talking about, holiness has been anything but freedom and fullness of life. Holiness is not a means for some people to have control over other people. Holiness, holiness is not God's restrictions because He enjoys making us miserable. Holiness is for our good. Holiness not only keeps us from those things that harm us, but it connects us to those things that are good for us. Holiness is saying no to certain things, but yes to the better things God has for us. So we have been redeemed, yes, to a life of holiness. Don't let anybody make that word holy a bad word or a negative word. It's only powerful and positive. We've been redeemed to a life of holiness. We've been redeemed to a life of happiness. I mean, when you read these words, does this not sound like a happy man? And these persecuted, exiled believers, do they not sound like happy people? I use the word happiness, but I'm talking about something much deeper than that. I'm talking about joy. Look what he says in verse 6. And all this you greatly, and all this, he's talking about 
being exiled, their great trials, their suffering. He says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And look what he says in verse 8. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. In chapter 4 and verse 13, But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. As we embarked upon our vacation, we were driving through Sioux City, and I passed it there for 19 years. And uh, one of my uh, uh, dear friends uh, is Dave, Dave Drew, who at, when I passed it there was a deputy sheriff, and today is the sheriff. He is, there's a new sheriff in town, and it's him. And um, so as I was driving through Sioux City, I texted him, and I said, I'm passing through Sioux City. Is it okay to speed? And he texted me back and said, no, don't speed. Uh, and he said, I gave my testimony tonight and told how 30 years ago a fellow brother of the badge got saved and started sending me letters about his conversion. And I told Jana, Jim has finally lost it. He was speaking of Jim Jackson, a policeman in our church. I thought he had lost it, but I finally agreed to visit his new church. He said there was a preacher man there from Memphis who sought me out. And what he meant by that is that Dave came to church on a Sunday, and it was a very, it was a very moving service, and we had gifts of the Spirit. We, people were weeping, and... He had never been in a church service like that in his life. In fact, as he was exiting the service, he was heard saying, I'll never go back to that church again. Well, that was my cue. That was my invitation. So the next night, I went out looking for him, and I found him. I found him in his car doing the radar thing. And he invited me in, and we sat, and we talked for about 20 minutes, and we really warmed up to each other, and he was very open, and I was very direct, and so he said, can we go have a bite to eat? And so we forged a friendship that became only deeper and has lasted all these years. So there was a preacher man there from Memphis who sought me out, and he said, within a few weeks, my wife and I knelt at the altar because the preacher man showed us the way for the last 30 years Jenna and I can sing, Oh, the blood that was shed for me. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Oh, the blood. It's my victory. Thank you for your love of Jesus, he said. Today my heart is filled with joy, love, and laughter. That's what I'm talking about. We've been redeemed to holiness. We've been redeemed to happiness. And then lastly, we've been redeemed to hope. Peter loves talking about hope. In verse 3, he talks about our living hope. In verse 13, set your hope on the grace of God. What a hope you and I have. What a hope you and I have. I interviewed uh, for a pastoral position in Eden Prairie, Minnesota many, many years ago, and I still remember a special moment in that interview process. One of the ladies on the pulpit committee looked at me, and she was from a land called Arkansas where human speech is turned into slow motion. Uh, I, you, you would think that she has a, would, ha, would have a mouthful of molasses when she talks. But I'll never forget this question. There was a longing in her eyes and in her voice as she asked, Pastor Hawkins, do you preach about heaven? 
I said, Sister, I preach about heaven more than anyone I know. And here I am today in a church whose mission statement is heaven. To go to heaven and to take as many with us as we can, we have a hope. That hope. All because of the precious blood of Christ. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were um, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Let's pray. Father, every one who is in your kingdom has come the same way. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And I thank you for the power of of His blood. All the sacrifices of the animals looked to, anticipated, and were fulfilled by this shedding of blood. No shedding of blood could ever need to be offered in the aftermath of Calvary. There's not a sinner on the planet that can't be cleansed and given a right standing before God because of that shed blood. So Lord, we accept that today by faith. We accept it because there's a rationale to our faith. We accept it today because of the Christ who came and lived a sinless life and died a substitutionary death and had a glorious resurrection. The Christ of whom and to whom and for whom we work and witness today. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here today that's not coming to the kingdom, who's not experienced that personal cleansing, that today is the day when they stop running and stop resisting and say, Jesus, I trust in you and I accept your sacrifice for me. And I believe that my sins will be washed away because of your precious blood. Their names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, new life imparted. Oh God, thank you for the miraculous transa transactions that have taken place endlessly in the aftermath of Calvary. Hallelujah. Glory, praise, and honor be to you. Our pastor's coming to lead us in our communion. God bless him. God bless you as he does. Those who are serving communion, please come and begin to serve. This morning you're here and you need Jesus to forgive you. You need his mercy and grace. You want to be a daily follower of Jesus, just lift your hand and say, here I am. I really want to follow Jesus every day, and I need his grace every day. Anybody here, just lift your hand. Thank you. Thank you. May Jesus just fill you up. May he help you. May he do all the work in you. He's here to heal you, to forgive you. He's a God of love and grace. We're going to sing this song about Jesus being the fairest, and because it is about Jesus. Amen. No other name but Jesus. Let's sing it, guys. Lift your voice. We're going to lift it up. Sing it out.
Where your love poured Bring me to my knees Lord, I lay me down Rid me of myself I belong to you Oh, lead me Lead me to the cross Sin in death. Now you're risen. 
Everything I want so dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Lead me. Will you stand with me reverently? Father God, we come to you. We run to your son, Jesus. And we remember the cross. We remember the suffering, the pain, the agony, the bruising. All we like sheep have gone astray. But God, you laid upon him, your son, Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. That our guilt and our shame might be wiped away. May we always run to the cross. May we always preach the cross that's foolishness to the world, but to us that are redeemed, that are purchased, that are bought back. It is the power of God unto salvation. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. And we behold, we look to you, Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, Jesus, we look to you, the victory that is in you, the holiness that is in you, the spirit that comes and was sent by you to be innocent among us. We look to you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you. And we take these elements that you said that when we gather together, that we would take them and remember you, Jesus. Remember your victory. Remember your cross. Remember your resurrection. Remember you, Jesus. Remember the good news, the gospel. To remember that your body was broken when you said, take this bread. And you broke it. And you blessed it. And you said, this is my body was broken for you. And you were saying, your body was broken that we could be whole. And so now in the name of Jesus, by your spirit, make every person that needs to be whole, make them whole. Heal them by your power, Lord. By the stripes that were bore upon your back, may there be healing in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus relationships that need to be made whole Lord I pray God as we receive it may your spirit Lord work work the reality of it in our lives and we give you glory let's receive it with thanksgiving expectation receive this bread that was given Jesus Christ's body for you hallelujah thank you Lord and the cup is blood he said, this is the cup of my covenant. This is the cup of my promise. That if you will confess your sins, that I will be faithful to forgive you, to cleanse you from all of your sins. That my blood will wash away your sin. That my blood is powerful enough for every sin. This is my covenant. Of the cup of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I offer it to you when you drink it. Do it in remembrance of me. So, Lord Jesus, we say thank you for forgiveness. People that are calling on you now, remembering their sins, and the enemy is making the list and holding up like he did to Luther, and he's lying to people, for he is a liar. We rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus, and we say this sin can be forgiven. It can, the guilt can be removed. The stains of the sin are gone, and the things that come in our life aren't because we've sinned, not because you don't like us, not because you don't love us. Your your blood has cleansed our sin. It's because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world of trouble and anguish, but there's joy of thy salvation in the midst of it. And we thank you, Jesus, and receive this cup with joy of your salvation and the forgiveness of sin, and we drink it in remembrance of you, Jesus, and of your cross and the provision of your forgiveness and redemption. In Jesus' name, oh, the precious blood of Jesus, we thank you. Let's eat, drink it together with thanksgiving and praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And you thank him, use your lips, say thank you, Jesus. If you love a person, you love your kids, you say thank you. You love your mother, your father, you say thank you. I love you. I love you, Jesus. 
use your words. Say, I love you, Jesus. You don't have to be loud. Just say it out loud under your breath. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. Let there be a murmur of praise. And just lift your arms, lift your hearts, lift your hands, lift your life. Give it all to Jesus. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we're running to you. We're running to you. We're running to your arms. Always, Jesus, you're more than enough. Sing that, will you, Pastor Brett? Forever reign. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. And nothing compares to your embrace. The light of the world forever reign. I'm running to your arms. He's not running to your arms. Of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to you, Lord. Oh, light of the world forever and more. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, oh light of the world, forever and you put your hands together and forever lift your voice and just thank you, Jesus. Lord. Thank the 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 Lord. Hallelujah. Oh God. Oh God of heaven. I just pray, Lord that we would believe you that we would believe you and how you love us that you made us and you bought us you made us like that little boy made his boat and you bought us like the little boy bought it back you purchased us you redeemed us we run to your arms of love and we want to be careful how we treat that precious blood not to trample on it like the Hebrew writer said by calling a lie the truth and the truth a lie, by excusing our sins and being careless, but we want to treat it as the most precious possession we have. Oh, the blood of Jesus that cleanses us, the blood of Jesus that frees us, that washes away the stains, the memories. Thank you, Jesus. Do a miracle, Lord. I pray, God, right now, my left in this far section, God, your peace and grace, your mercy and strength and healing be upon these people, Lord. May your love, God, upon these here again, mercy, peace, and grace. Mercy, peace, and grace be multiplied to you. Mercy, peace, and grace be multiplied to you. Mercy, group, grace, and peace be multiplied to you, you young people. Mercy. And His peace and His grace, His cleansing and forgiveness be unto you, be unto you. His mercy, His peace, His grace be unto you. And may the love of God fill your hearts and go into the darkness of this world. May your arms of love as Jesus runs to you. We run to Him. May we run to others with our love, with our arms open, with our arms of grace, with our arms of mercy, our arms of forgiveness, our arms of kindness to love those who are blind and cannot see, who are crippled and cannot walk spiritually. Love them, God, and receive them. Lord, we thank you. A beautiful message to remind us of oh, the precious, precious blood of Jesus. It's just spilling off of that cross, running down over our lives to free us from ourselves. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you grateful today? Are you grateful? Praise God. Hey, you know what? I want to do something for me. I, I'm noticing something. It, this is a little little different now, but I want you to know what Jesus does with his blood is he makes us one, the church, right, with his love. And I want you, if you've been here two years or less, raise your hand real high. I don't want everybody to look around. Raise it real high. Okay, look all around. Behind you, just everybody gawk. Look around. Two years or less. Everybody look. Behind you, go ahead, turn around, look around. To your side, 
Keep looking. Hold it real high, guys. If you're here two years or less, hold high. All right. Now you see why it's important you be the church. Because those people think the rest of you owe it to them to be the church. But guess what? I need you that walk with God before you came here to be the church. Okay? You love people. You reach out to people. You say, my name is. Because a church service with a sermon is worthless unless there's a church body with bridges built. You understand? Because you build a bridge relationship to somebody, and they, when, 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 when you do and you minister to them, when you need something, that bridge is built. They'll walk across that bridge to you, and they'll love you. And you try to just be by yourself. You don't worry about talking to anybody or having someone over or saying, hey, let's go out. And you just sit over here by yourself. Guess what? When you have trouble, nobody even knows you because you've never built a bridge to them to love them. How are they ever going to get to you? Right? So I want you to do something right now. Give them that love that Jesus gave you, okay? And that's the end of the whole thing right there, and I'm leaving. Bye, and I'll see you later.